Hello and welcome back to... <laughs> I startled Harvey because she's been sleeping on my lap for like the past half hour while I was sitting here scrolling on TikTok. And I just startled her awake. Welcome back to your regularly scheduled episode that actually came out this week. <laughs> Sorry about last week. I have been... I've been going through it. I just sort of had the realization that like I put a lot of work into this and I don't get a lot out of it which is fine I basically make enough to break even on what it costs to keep it running which is fine whatever I don't I'm not complaining because I love the support that I do have it has been long standing these people have been with me and I appreciate it so much but I've been doing this for like four years now something absolutely crazy like that and I it just has never really taken off in a way that keeps me inspired to do it I guess if that makes sense especially now that I'm doing it alone like it takes me all week especially now that I have to make these cases longer because there's not as much banter to stretch out the length of the episode these episodes would be so short so I am spending all of this extra time to make sure it is like a substantial episode there's meat to it you have something to actually like sit down and listen to which takes me like all week then I sit down and record it and then I have to do it immediately after that I have to start all over again to like get these out on time make sure they're good episodes and like I am just not willing to compromise like how hard I work I can't work less it's just like not the way my brain is wired as you can tell from like some of the lengthy episodes I've done and some of the short ones I've done that turned into be like super long ones I just like cannot compromise the research on a case to make it easier for myself because that just doesn't make sense because then you're getting cheated out of information that like is readily available for me to tell you but I'm trying to save myself time that just doesn't make sense so I have been grappling with the idea of if it's time to just let it go let it flow out into the abyss give it a viking funeral launch a flaming bow and arrow at it and watch it go up in flames because after Taryn left I thought I would give it a go on my own um rightfully lost a lot of listeners and support which is completely fine I understand I turned it into a completely different show completely understandable I have no qualms with that I knew it was coming it just has never really recovered from that I'm making perhaps half, sometimes a third presently what we were making. So please don't be sad (laughs) if I'm not making any decisions now because I don't think you're supposed to make any large decisions like this during Mercury retrograde, which it is in retrograde right now. So I don't plan on making any large decisions anytime soon unless something comes up. That makes the decision a little easier for me. But um, don't be sad if this is it. We might be near on the end here. I just don't know how much more I have it in me. I just... It's hard to explain the amount of time this takes up for me. And, like, what it leaves me with, I guess, is more... I don't care the amount of time it takes, but the amount of time between that and my job, which are, like, two things I just can't compromise time on, unless I get rid of it, like we're talking about. But those, for the sake of the argument, those are two things that, like, have to be done. That's fine. I work late one night. I have to research this episode. It usually takes me maybe anywhere between like four and eight hours to research an episode that's like all my free time after work 
then I go to bed, then I wake up, I go to work, and I'd like it's a cycle. To put it in perspective, I have read I have read maybe this past week and a half where I didn't put out an episode, I didn't research one, I just like didn't have it in me, literally couldn't even get it started. I tried and everything I doing, my attention was somewhere else. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to skip it. I read four, maybe five books in that week and a half, which is crazy. I love reading. I just do not have time to do it because I am reading article after article after article, and then I'm trying to piece it all together, and then like I just don't have time. The only time I had to read was maybe I would read when I got in bed until I fell asleep. So I would maybe get like... 30, 35, 40 minutes of reading in every day. I read an entire book yesterday, and it was great. Loved it. And there's just other stuff I miss doing that, like, I just sort of had to push aside. I'm sure my Nintendo Switch thinks I died. I haven't even touched it. So, just... I'm just, like, word vomiting you all of my problems. And they're not problems, per se, But I'm just trying to let you in my mind a little bit (laughs) so you understand where I'm coming from, why this is happening, why when the podcast ends, did it, and I'm just letting you know, like, these are the thoughts going through my brain. I'm really feeling a sense of peace if I decide to let it go. I feel like I have put everything I have into it, and I loved doing it so much. I just wouldn't feel sad about it. We have created something fantastic. I love talking at you guys every week. (laughs) I hope you guys like me talking at you. Um, But like I said, no concrete decision yet. I do not take this lightly. I do really, really want to think about it. I was going to record an episode today using old show notes from an old episode And then I opened those notes and I realized they were terrible and I have no, absolutely no idea how I made that into an episode. (laughs) So that's going to be next week's episode is going to be an old episode, but I will be freshly re-recording it as opposed to today's episode, which I'm sure you have noticed, is a re-upload of an old episode to make it up for you. This was a two-parter. I'm just going to upload it as one long-ass episode. This was one of my absolute favorite cases to research. If you have never heard of it, you are in for a treat. I also am doing this one because it was not very popular at the time that I released it because Taryn had COVID. Maybe, maybe I had COVID. We really went through a cycle of... (laughs) alternating COVID together. Um, So it wasn't very popular for that reason because we were a duo recording that anytime I had to do a solo episode, it sort of suffered because people were there for Terrence. But now that you guys are, for the most part, everyone listening knows that this is a solo epi- solo podcast now. This won't come as a shock to you and you won't be as bored because this is what you have been used to. I hope you'll enjoy it if you didn't like it the first time or if you skipped it for that reason. I am glad that you are going to give it another shot now. Very long, very good, very frustrating. I will say that. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I think I have like word vomited enough. I don't really have much more to say. (laughs) I don't. My main, main concern with this is I don't want the people who support and listen and message me and all of this to feel like that doesn't matter to me because it very, very much does. It's arguably the reason I am still doing this this long because I do feel that appreciation and I want to give you something because you listen and you give me something and that's fantastic, but... You know, I skipped a week. 
Um, the only person who said anything was my mom. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. I was like waiting for like, where is the episode? Nothing. Not a nobody messaged or texted me or anything like that. So I feel like that's all I have to say. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for continuing to listen. Thank you for listening while I figure out what I'm going to do. I hope you don't mind that this is an old episode. Obviously, next week I'm going to revamp the notes from, like I said, and it's an extremely old episode. It was very popular at the time that I did it. I'm excited to go back into these notes and add some more things of substance for you guys because I have I literally looked at it. I was like, I have no idea how this was an hour episode because there is quite literally nothing here. <laughs> so, hope you enjoy that. If you're on the Patreon, I do have a new episode for you next week. I have had it typed up for a couple weeks now. It's very interesting. I'm very excited to tell you. But like I said, I was just really going through it. I didn't even really feel like sitting down to record it, honestly. So thank you so much for understanding. Harvey is jumping around like a absolute maniac. And now it's time for dinner. So please enjoy the re-record of The Disappearance of Susan Cox Powell. Like I said, one of my favorite episodes to date still. It was one of our earlier ones. We've done hundreds of episodes after that, and it's still one that really, really sticks out to me. It is, I would pay any amount of money to figure out what happens here. And without further ado, please enjoy my voice on our old recording equipment. So bear with me with that. Hopefully it's not too bad. I don't remember what I was working with at the time. And I will see you next week and on Monday. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Yo, yo, yo. (laughs) Did that sound like Taryn? Because, spoiler alert, it wasn't. Because we are creating some truly chaotic energy in the studio today because it is just me alone in here on a Monday afternoon before work. (laughs) Um, No guests, no Taryn this week. Um, We're just being overly cautious with the COVID thing. The COVID thing. (laughs) Sound like a Karen. It's Ohio is just like a friggin' hot spot, so there's been some quarantining. I mean, we're all fine, but it's pretty much unavoidable. We're trying to stay as safe as possible. That's that. So I'm going to be doing this episode alone today, which is going to be super awkward for me. So um, <laughs> please be nice to me because I'm sitting in where we record so nervous, but nobody's even here. So what the fuck does it matter? So I'm going to be doing The Disappearance of Susan Cox Powell, which is pretty popular, but I, even I forgot how intricate and crazy this story is. Um, there's a couple good documentaries. There's a, um, a good Oxygen documentary and there's a good ID channel documentary. Um, if you choose to watch them, I would watch the ID channel one first just because it has more of, like, the basics, the need-to-know points, like, in order, and the oxygen one is coming at it almost from the viewpoint that you already know what's going on, and it's inserting new interviews, new details, new things like that. So, um, if, after listening, you want to watch and get more information, which I suggest you do, I would do it in that order, but that's up to you. Okay, so I'm gonna get started, um, I told, <laughs> told Darren that this is going to, like, prove that how much people like her more <laughs> when this episode gets, like, no downloads. Because I know Taryn is much, much more <laughs> funnier than I am. And I don't want to say mean, but <laughs> Taryn doesn't hold back in the way that I do about anything. So, um, I'm sorry if this isn't as good as it normally is, but, um, 
hopefully in a year we look back and think like, isn't that so crazy? Like you had to record an episode alone because of like a worldwide fucking pandemic. And hopefully we never have to do it again. And also we were going to try and record like remotely. Like I don't even know how that works. We can barely record in person. Sometimes it doesn't work together with the equipment right in front of us. So we just decided to not attempt it. We'd rather get out a quality episode on time than have delays and have it still be terrible from being recorded in two different locations. So hopefully soon we make (laughs) enough money. We want to get a really nice mixer and some new microphones that I think will make a difference with like all of this. But we're still new and we're still a little and tiny. So here goes nothing. Okay, so Susan was born on October 16th, 1981 to Chuck and Judy Cox. Um, Her parents met in the Church of the Latter-day Saints, and Susan and her sisters were raised in the Church of LDS. So um, the LDS Church is Mormon. That's what um, Church of Latter-day Saints means. So it's very, very traditional. Like when I talked about Betty Broderick and how like she wasn't exactly raised to be a mother and do that kind of stuff, this, these girls were raised with the um, expectation that they would be mothers and wives, and that's what they would do. So that's how their life was, like, planned out for them. Um, but it's also different because this is exactly what Susan wanted. It's not like they were forcing this traditional ideal on her that um, you're a woman, so you have to get married, you have to have babies, you have to listen to your husband and work she wanted this. Her whole life dream was to be a mom and a wife, so she didn't mind. Joshua Powell was born um, January 20th, 1976 to Stephen and Teresa Powell. I think it's Teresa Powell. They hardly ever, ever talk about his mom. She's not involved or in the picture for very long. Um, It's spelled T E R R. I-C-A, but I think I heard them pronounce it something like Teresa, so I'm just going to say that because I honestly don't think I say it again. Um, He had a bit of a different upbringing than Susan did, though. Like, Susan's family was very tight. Her parents, they were like a family unit, like like what you would expect from a very religious upbringing. Um, Joshua's parents divorced when he was very young, which is like... It's extremely unusual in LDS marriages, I believe, to even, like, fathom the idea of a divorce, let alone go through with it. But, um, I don't believe his dad was a part of the LDS church. I believe it was his mother who was a part of that. Um, so it was just kind of like a tumultuous upbringing. Like, nobody agreed on anything ever. Um, so... To go along with their childhoods, Josh and Susan were also very different from each other. She was very quiet and reserved. She didn't like confrontation at all. She just, like, wanted to mind her own business. Please, people, you you are picturing, like, an exact person in your mind. That's Susan. Josh, however, and everyone says this in all these documentaries, like, Susan's family, his family... Josh is very loud. Like, he's just a loud person. He likes his views to be known. Um, He's never wrong. If you disagree with him on anything, you're wrong. Um, He was also very controlling. Like, it was his way or the highway. Like, there was just no... Like, that's just what it was. There was no... um, What's the word I'm looking for? I want to say confrontation, but it doesn't, but it sounds like that compromise. (laughs) There was no compromising with him. This is going great. So, um, despite the fact that Josh's parents got divorced and his dad wasn't very involved with the church, Josh decided to stay within the church of LDS. And that's actually where him and Susan meet in November of 2000. They meet at something called a Mormon ward after a class, a church class that they shared together. And a Mormon ward is basically like, um, a singles event type of dinner. I've seen this described a couple different ways and called a couple different things and how they met and where they met, but um, this is kind of what I gathered from it. 
So they meet at this singles event, this singles dinner. They know each other are single. Um, they bonded over their love of birds. Like, they both loved birds. And this is the exact moment where Taryn would look at me with giant eyes because that bitch hates birds. Like, hates birds. I don't mind birds. So that's the part where Taryn would start yelling. God, I miss her. Anyway, so after they meet at this ward, they're engaged two months later. I know, two freaking months. But things just work so much differently in it, like a, in the realm of churches. It sounds so awkward, but um, like things are expected to move fast. So April 6th, 2001, my birthday again, two cases in a row, um, Susan and Josh got married and Susan was only 19 and he was 23 or 24. I have seen it both ways. So they also married in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. So if that gives you kind of like an idea of what they were dealing with, like there's no divorces, no nothing. Like they signed up for straight up life together. So, like I said, her family just calls him, like, a loud know-it-all. Um, her family asked her to please not marry Josh. Um, her mom told Susan that when she looks at Josh, she sees darkness in his eyes. Like, just not really. <laughs> you spend your whole life wanting to get married, and you finally get married, and your family's like, please don't. <laughs> and they're like, this is my dream. That's your dream, Dad. Just kidding. But um, she wanted to get married so bad and she was so in love with Josh that she just like went ahead with it anyway. So um, after they get married, they live with Stephen's, no, they live with Josh's father, Stephen, for a couple years in Puyallup, Washington to save some money before they make their eventual move to West Valley City, Utah to be near Josh's mother and sister. So, um, when they moved to Westlake, Susan starts a career as a stockbroker and Josh started working in an IT. And I don't think that was that unusual. Um, Josh was very into technology and things like that. And, um, I'm really not sure why Susan chose that career. I, it might've just been a job opening that was available to her. I believe she had her, like her cosmetology license and everything, but, um, so she ended up working for a stockbroking company. So then on January 19th, 2005, she has her first son, Charlie, and then she had her second son, Brayden, in 2007. So now I'm going to get into the disappearance. So I need you to buckle up because this shit, the whole thing, you're going to be rolling your eyes the whole time. So on the morning of December 7th, 2009, the babysitter was expecting Susan Cox Powell to drop her kids off that morning. So she would... um drop her kids off at a babysitter's house, go to work from there. So when she didn't show up that morning, it was very bizarre. Susan was like a creature of, not a creature of habit, but like she had a schedule and she wouldn't just not show up and not tell the babysitter she wouldn't show up. So um, the babysitter called both Susan and Josh's work and neither of them were at work that morning. So she decided to go to their house and make sure everything was okay. I think, um, their community was very small. I think they were very involved in the church there. So, like, everyone they knew was kind of from the church. So, it wasn't unusual to just, like, I'm just going to go see if everything's okay. So, she gets there, and um, there were not any tracks in the snow. It, there had been a huge snowstorm that night. So, there's no tracks. So, she's assuming, okay, nobody has left the house because there would be tire tracks coming out of the garage. So, um, she's like, okay, they're, they have to still be in the house. And the week before, Susan had asked the babysitter's husband how to service the furnace. So now she's worried about, like, carbon monoxide poisoning. Like, maybe Susan did try to fix the furnace by herself. Something went wrong. And, like, uh, there was a poisoning in there. So the babysitter calls Josh's sister, Jennifer, who lives there, and his mother. So both of them show up, and they call the police to report both of them missing because at this point they don't know what's going on um josh susan neither of the kids are to be seen so the police show up and they're like 
if you give us permission, we can enter the house now and look. But, like, if you don't give us permission, we'll have to wait and get a warrant or something like that. So they're like, we'll enter the house if you agree to take responsibility for the window that we have to break to get inside of the home. So Josh's family is like, yes, please, just get in there and make sure everything is okay. So they enter the home and immediately see two big box fans pointed towards the couch. And the couch had been recently cleaned. So it's like drying the couch off, like cleaning solution, drying it, getting it nice and clean. But that is it. All the other furniture is dirty. Um, The floor is dirty. It's just these two big box fans trying to dry off a couch. And then they do like a lap around the house and notice that Susan's purse is there with all her stuff in it. She's got keys, wallet, everything. So all of her stuff is still in the house. So like I said, they were in the very tight-knit Mormon community where they lived. So word got out really quick that, um, you know, Josh and Susan are missing. Nobody knows where they are. Her stuff is at home. So um, her best friend, Kersey, comes to her house and she said, um, she was talking, she's, um, she's in these documentaries, so she's doing interviews and what, in one of her interviews, she's like, when I got there, I was like, you know, Josh just won a camera at his work party, like a nice camera. Maybe they went up to the mountains to take pictures of the boys yesterday and then like something happened and they never made it home. Like maybe their car had slid off the road, something. So, Kersey starts calling all of her friends and learns that Giovanna had been with them last the night before that they went missing because they would meet, like, once a month and crochet and knit and just kind of catch up. It was, like, their little scheduled hangout. So, she said when she was there the night before that um, she and Susan spoke in the living room while she was making a blanket for one of her boys and Josh was in the kitchen making food, um... He had made pancakes for dinner, which seems normal at first, but um, what's important to understand is that Josh never, ever, ever cooked. He never did any of the home stuff. Like, that was all Susan's realm. Like, it was, like, if you tell people who know them, like, oh yeah, Josh cooked dinner last night, they're like, that's off. Like, that's not right, mama. Something is wrong. So then, um, so they make the food he he makes the food serves it they eat it and then susan said she was feeling tired she's gonna go lay down this is at like five o'clock she's like i just feel really tired i feel kind of off i'm gonna go lay down and then giovanna said that um josh was basically rushing her out of the door at this point like he was like i'm gonna take the boy sledding so like see you later getting her out the front door. I think he pulled out of the driveway before she had even, like, walked off the porch. Like, he was in a huge hurry to get her out of there and get himself out of there. So, um, that morning, when they're all missing, nobody can get a hold of Josh or Susan. However, Josh answers a call from Giovanna that morning. So, like, she finds out everyone's missing. She goes there. She explains that she just saw them last night. And she's like, fuck it, I'm gonna call him then. So she calls him and he just picks up like nothing is wrong. And he's like, I'm in Westlake and Susan should be at work or something. And Giovanna's like, okay, well, she's not at work. So you need to get the hell home because there are like a ton of police here. Everybody is worried. Susan is not at work. Like something is off. You need to get home. So he's like, okay, I'll be there in a little bit. So then he drives 20 minutes south to leave Susan a voicemail like, 20 minutes away from his house after this phone call. Like, he doesn't immediately turn around and start going back. He keeps driving the opposite direction, gets 20 minutes away, and leaves Susan a voicemail, like, oh, hey, like, like, everything is normal. So then the detective calls Josh, the detective that is at their home. He's in, um, the Oxygen documentary, too. And he's like, you need to get here right now. And Josh is like, well, I have to, like, feed my kids first. And the detective was like, I don't care. Like, your wife is missing. Do you not care that your wife is missing? Like, he's acting so guilty. Like, he's acting like he knows Susan is not coming back already. Like, don't you think? Like, oh, shit. What do you mean Susan's missing? What the hell? Then, no. 
no, nothing. He's like, I'll just be home in a little bit. What is the rush? So he's like, I'll feed the kids and I'll be there. Except he still doesn't go home. After he talks to the detective, he drives to Susan's work and calls her from the parking lot to tell her that he's there to pick her up from work, even though he knows for certain that she's not at work now. He's had two people tell him that his wife did not go to work and that she's missing. So after he hears that, he goes to work, leaves Susan a voicemail like, hey, I'm just, I'm outside waiting to pick you up. Um, like, just so shady. Um. You, I believe you can hear these exact calls if you listen to the um, documentary. So I think they say he finally gets home at like 6 p.m. that day. Like he was gone all day after like people knew that Susan was missing at like 7 in the morning. So when he finally gets there, the detective just takes him straight to the police station to interview him because they have been trying to get a hold of him all day. Um, so the detective asks when the last time he saw Susan was. He's like, oh, I saw her around midnight right before I left at like 1230 to take the boys camping in the West Desert. Yeah, this is when Taryn would be staring at me again. Camping at midnight in December when he knows there's a severe snowstorm coming. So then the detective is like, why would you take your two young sons camping at midnight on a Sunday? when you work the next morning because she went missing Sunday night into Monday morning. And he says, oh, I forgot it was Sunday. Like, I thought all day that, like, it was Saturday, which doesn't make sense because Susan goes to church. Like, you know it's Sunday. Susan's getting up. She's going to church. You know what day it is. At 1230 at night, you don't just think, oh, it's a Saturday night, going to go camping. The boys wanted s'mores. If they want s'mores, just cook them in your back fucking yard. So, um, they search his car and they do find a ton of camping equipment, which is kind of like corroborate his story, like, um, food and sleeping bags, like just regular camping shit. And Josh was just known for being super weird. Like, if you tell any of these people that Josh took his kids camping at midnight in December, they'd be like, yeah, that sounds about, that sounds like something Josh would do, which is just so weird. I hate this man. So they're in, like, they're not interrogating him, but they kind of are, but like they're interviewing him because his wife is missing and he's just so quiet. He's not asking any questions, which is bizarre because why wouldn't you want to know as much information as you can? And it's also be bizarre because like I said, he is so loud normally. He's so loud, he's in your face, he knows everything, he wants to know everything. Like, it's just, it's very bizarre behavior from him. And then he says, in the interview, he says that the daycare provider who was there, who got there first, had a key to their house, so he doesn't understand why they had to break his window. He never asked the police what he think happened, what they're going to do, what he can do to help nothing. He's like, I just don't understand why you had to break my window open if you had a key you could have just went inside so then josh starts getting agitated with the question saying that susan would have went to work if he wasn't there or something like i went camping she would have went to work and the detective was like okay but she didn't go to work like we know she did not go to work so you can quit saying that then josh says that he just wants to leave They only questioned him for an hour under the agreement that he would come back the next morning for a scheduled interview. Like, you can go home now, get some rest, maybe think and use your brain for a hot second, but you have to come back tomorrow. Like, we're penciling you in and you have to come in. So, Josh's mom and sister arrive to his house the next morning when Josh is supposed to be on his way to this scheduled police appointment, and he's not there he well he's not at the police appointment he's still at home he's cleaning out his car he's doing loads of laundry he's just wandering around the house like no big fucking deal so he arrived for his interview at the police station four hours late with no explanation he offered like no lie no explanation no like oh my god i'm so sorry i just couldn't get out of bed i was so nothing he just waltzes in and it's like here we go Um, you can see this footage from these interviews. It's so crazy. Um, he looks so annoyed to even be there. 
And the detective said at that point he was very concerned with how Josh was spending that last three and a half hours that he wasn't there. Um, Like, was he cleaning up evidence from the car? Was he getting rid of something from the house? Like, now I have to be concerned about why he was late and what he was spending that time instead doing. So, um, this is when, this whole interview was bizarre. He offers, like, no, no help at all to help find Susan. So then the police try and, like, start baiting him into saying things. So then the police are like, "Mm, like, was she, like, suicidal or anything? And Josh is like, oh yeah, she definitely was. She was, she thought about it. She was depressed. Like, they said that he jumped all over that as soon as they mentioned it. Which is Shadesville Supreme. So, um, while he's being questioned this time, he had his kids with him the night before. So today, fresh day, the kids are not with him. Like, they weren't allowed to go with him. What Josh doesn't know, that while he's being questioned, that Josh's mom took them to the counseling center and his children were being interviewed about what happened. There was a not interviewed, but, like, they were talking to a social worker. So, Charlie is almost five at this time, and Brayden is three. So, I know they're not, like, the most reliable, but they have, like, thoughts. Like, they can remember things. Like, they're not babies. So, this is when the social worker is talking to Charlie, and Charlie tells her that um, he went camping with his daddy and his mommy, And when they came home from camping, that his dad came home with them, but his mommy stayed there where the crystals are. And I don't really know what the crystals are part means. I don't think we we ever do, but um, this kid is like, no, mom went with us and she did not come back with us, which is Shay D. Shady. I wish Taryn was here (laughs) to hear this. So the detective is about to let him leave his police interview when they get the phone call from the counseling center about the mom, about Susan going with them and staying there. So Josh is like, no, Susan wasn't with us. Sometimes my kids are liars, he says. So he's just denying everything. He's offering nothing. He doesn't, he's not asking any questions. Like, it's just so bizarre. So the police are like, if you don't want to talk, you can leave. Like, you could have always left. We don't have anything on him. Like, you can leave. And he's like, yeah, I want to think about it for a few days, like whether or not he wanted to keep talking to the police or do anything. And the detective goes, Josh, your wife is missing and you want to take a few days to think about whether or not you want to talk to us. Yeah, I know. It's just shady from start to fucking finish. Um, so they tell him at that time that they were searching the van that whole time and they have a search warrant for the house and they'd be done with his van within the hour and to just, you can sit and wait and we'll give it, get it back to you. Like within the hour. So it could have been like 15, 20, 30 minutes he could have had this van back. So he waits for like 15 minutes, all jittery at the police station and then he calls a taxi and just leaves with all of his shit there. So after this, he goes to the airport rents a car and puts 806 miles on it and is gone for 20 hours. Josh also uses his phone zero times and his dad's phone has zero activity that day as well. So there's a rumor that they were like together this day. So they're also searching his home at this time and they find tiny minute blood droplets by the freshly cleaned couch. Like, little, little tiny droplets, which is weird because if you were just cleaning, deep cleaning your couch, why would you not clean the surrounding area? Like, even if you're just regular cleaning, like, you're just going to leave blood droplets after you carpet clean your couch? I don't think so. So that's odd. They also get Josh's hard drives, but they're all encrypted with a super strong password. Like, um, nobody can, nobody could break into them at the FBI police station, nothing. So on December 16th, after Josh was so uncooperative, they named him as a person of interest. 
However, they had no idea what the motive could be at this point. They know this dude is shady, but it's not adding up to them why, why he would do something yet. So after this, after he's named as a suspect, everything, um, in the middle of the night, Josh packs up his house and moves him and his kids back to Washington, where his dad lives, just completely abandons his home. Like, everyone in this community is searching for Susan because she's missing. Like, we don't know if she's dead or anything. So everyone's trying to find her, and he has just completely left. Which they point out, like, in a hypothetical scenario, if Susan was missing, that's where she would return to if she were going to return anywhere. So he's already counting on the fact that she's not coming back. Because why would you not wait for her? To come back to her home. So, um, after a while, Josh speaks out and tells the media that she was emotionally abused as a child and that her father had an anger problem and her mom was emotionally abusive. And maybe that's why she had to flee. Like, maybe that's why she had to get out of there. Then Josh and his father post the website susanpowell.org where they post this insane theory. I just can't believe it's just okay. They post this theory that Susan ran away with another man, Stephen Kocher, and went to Brazil with him to run away. There is zero evidence that these two people had ever even met. Like there's zero evidence that they had even passed each other at a grocery store. Like they do not know each other. Um and so not only do they post this online, they double down on this theory in person, in interviews. They tell the media that, like, they're certain she's alive. She's with another man. They're not worried about, like, her well-being, her missing, recovering her body. She's not dead. She's alive. She is with another man. So then in February of 2010, Susan's family had had a fucking nuff. They come out and they say that they know Susan had been a victim of domestic abuse in her home. They're just like no longer, I don't know if they ever were on the, oh, Josh is so nice train, but they're off of it now for sure. They're not calling him a good dad, nothing. He's a shitty person. So her friends said that Josh changed when Susan had the boys. Um, Susan said he just wasn't the person that she married anymore. He was even more rude and combative. Um, Susan's father tells the story that um, they were all together when Susan went into labor, actually, and Susan's dad was telling him, like, Josh, it's time to go. We have to go. Like, this, there's no messing around. It's time. Because at this time, Josh was sitting on his computer just, like, messing around. He's like, yeah, just give me a minute and I'll be right there. So Susan's dad is like, Okay, we're leaving. Take all the minutes you want, but we are not. So then Josh showed up an hour and a half later to the hospital and sat down next to the window about 20 feet away from Susan and started playing on his computer at the hospital. So this dude is just, he's cold, distant, weird. I don't trust him as far as I could throw him. Josh was also very controlling, Um, They used to have two cars. He sold their second car so she wouldn't have her own car. Um, He also controlled all the money. He would give her a list of groceries that were on sale and said she could only get what was on the list and she would get like $10 to buy food for the week. Um, Her friend Kersey said that um, she would come over with the boys and ask if like she could borrow a hot dog to feed the kids because they were so hungry and she just had nothing she could feed them. But Josh would spend hella dollars on ridiculous shit. Um, Susan has a little thing I'll talk about later. A little video. But she's talking and she's like, here are all the drums of wheat that Josh bought. Just like, like big barrel drums. Like 12 of them. Full of wheat. But Susan can't buy more than $10 worth of groceries in a week to feed everyone in the house. Which is also, um, one of Susan's other friends also said that, uh, Josh had his own food. Like, he would buy his own food that they couldn't eat. Like, snacks and stuff that he would keep for him. So, it's not like they were all starving. It was just Susan and the kids who were suffering from this. 
So, then the police get a call from an old co-worker of Josh's that said him and Josh were talking, and Josh said the best way to dispose of a body, mm -hmm, to dispose of a body, would be to dump it down a vertical mine shaft. He would watch all these forensic shows that I'm sure we all watch, so it's not that bizarre. But he would watch these shows and point out what the criminals did wrong and how he would do it differently to get away with it. Um, the mine thing is important because they live around a ton of mines. There are like tens of thousands of mine shafts, and they go so deep that you really would never be able to find anything in these mine shafts. Um, they're like straight vertical drops like into these cliffs. So the police logged 6,000 man hours searching the mines for Susan's body. Like they thought for sure that was it. And maybe it is it, but they just didn't, you can't, it's too much. So they spent 6,000 hours looking for Susan's body and they are no closer to connecting Josh to the disappearance than they were when it first happened. Like this whole time, they are certain he's involved, but they can't link him to, like, anything concrete. They have no motive. They have no evidence. So, um, they said when they were searching the mines that they knew it was a long shot. Like, they knew they probably wouldn't be able to find anything in them. But they were really hoping that it would rattle Josh. Like, oh, shit, why, why are they searching the mines? And it would get him worked up and talking. But, um, it didn't. So, um, so after this, they start to just branch out and look at those people who are closest to Josh. So they start looking at his father, Steve. And when I tell you to like buckle the hell up for some bullshit, do it now because this is the crazy, arguably, no, it's not even the craziest part of this story, which is insane, but you are not going to believe the things you are going to hear. So buckle up. So, um, Josh and his dad said that Susan was promiscuous and they have her journals and her journals would prove she was obsessed with sex. And Josh's dad said that, um, him and Susan interacted sexually all the time and that the feelings were definitely mutual and Susan was leading him on and like they have her diaries and these diaries would prove the theory that she ran away with another man they're like if you read these you would understand what we know and why we think what we think and it's not that shocking that susan would run away with another man okay also the oxygen documentary has like an exclusive interview with josh's sister alina which i was kind of because i don't think she had done very many interviews about this but um Spoiler alert, Alina is fucking crazy. So you're going to watch it and you're going to... You do kind of feel bad it is her family as well. It's her family being accused of these crazy crimes. But girl, get a motherfucking grip. So Alina's like, yeah, Susan was always flirting with my dad. Which is not fucking true. Just wait until you hear. So Susan's dad was super pissed about her journals being read and... They were releasing portions of them because these are her diaries. These are the journals of a teenage girl. Like, it's her diary. It's private. Her parents are, her dad is really in this documentary, and he's, you can tell how pissed he is. He said he was sickened by the thought that Josh's father read them and, like, interpreted what she was saying in his pervert mind. Like, he was so uncomfortable with whatever was going on over there. And Josh even filed a restraining order against Susan's father. So these two families hate each other. Like, there is no, no love lost between them. They hate each other. So the police asked for the journals, like, hey, if you have these journals, that could really help us solve this case for you. Like, maybe we could look into the theory that she ran away. So at first, I think they agree, and then Josh and his dad change their mind. and like, no, you're not getting any originals. You're not getting any copies. No way. So you're probably thinking, why don't they just get a warrant and go take them? In order to get a warrant, you have to know where they are. Like, you can't just get a warrant for everyone's home and hope that they're there. So um, this is when they plan something called the Honkin' Wave, which is in these documentaries. It's on the news. You can see this everywhere. So they 
The police plan this with Susan's father to try and rile up Josh and his dad, Steve, to get them to admit where the journals are. Like, they're hoping this will rattle them and they'll say something stupid that they don't mean. So they organize the honk and wave. They specifically chose a place that Josh and Stephen would see it, which um, Susan's dad, Chuck, did not know. He was involved in the planning with the police a little bit. Like, he knew this was kind of like, it is to get attention for Susan's case and bring awareness to it, but it's also... It's really like a trap to try and get Josh's family. So the police plan it at this place by um, Josh and Stephen's house, but not close enough because they have the restraining order, remember? But the police know that Stephen Powell drives past this place um, every Saturday to go to the bank. Chuck didn't know that. So this is August 2011. So, Alina is with Stephen as he's driving past, as he would. The police know he's going to. And she tried to get him to leave it alone. She's like, don't even stop, Dad. The honkin' wave is basically what it sounds like. Um, Kersey and Susan's father and other supporters are standing at the corner in front of this um, gas station. Holding signs, like, just honk for awareness. Like, get people to look over here. Trying to find my daughter. That's basically what it is. So they drive past, and Alina's like, don't stop. Just don't feed into this. Just keep going. So Stephen is obviously like, well, no, I'm going to stop. And this is all on the news. The news is covering the honk and wave before Stephen even gets there. So Stephen rolls up, and they're like, jackpot. So um, they're like, Steve, why would you come here to this? if you have been such, like, a vocal opponent to whatever has happened to Susan, like, you don't believe she's missing, you believe she ran away, why would you stop at this place that's trying to raise awareness for her? And he's like, oh, I just wanted to get a picture of Chuck here because I believe he's violating a restraining order because sometimes Josh shops at this gas station, which is not how a restraining order works, and Chuck has the restraining order on him because he was prepared for this to happen. The police told him this would happen. So he gets out the restraining order. He's reading it to Stephen. He's like, listen, Josh can shop wherever he wants. I can go wherever I want. I'm just not allowed to approach Josh or talk to him. And even the news person is like, if there's a restraining order, why did you come here? Like, you guys don't want to be around him. You filed it with the court. So why are you actively approaching him? So in the middle of all of this, Josh shows up to this event with the boys where he addresses the camera and he says that, like, A lot of people have done a lot of attacks against our family, attacks against our son, and all of those attacks have been led by Susan's father, Chuck Cox, which is just delusional. So before the Powells leave this event, like they're starting, you can kind of tell they're starting to leave, but they need this information on the journals. So Steve says, he's talking to the media, to the news, you can see this, it's insane. He's like, um, we know a lot about the Cox family because we read Susan's journals. We have her journals. They hold a lot of incriminating evidence and back up all the things we're saying. We can prove it. So he's not even provoked. He just admits that he has the journals where he is. They've read them. And it's full of evidence. So the police are watching this happen because it was their idea. And they're like, you fucking idiot. So at that very moment, they're able to obtain a search warrant for Stephen Powell's home. Where they unlock... A mother load of evidence. I can't, I'm, I can begin to explain the evidence because I'm going to. But you are not even prepared for what they find in this home. So, they get the search warrant. They go to the home, Stephen Powell's home, where Alina calls it harassment, that they're in her home. Harassment on her family. It's not, because when they get to his home, they find out that Stephen was in love with Susan. He was desperately in love with her, like he wanted to marry her. He loved her. He had tens of thousands of words written about her. He kept his own diaries about how much he loved her, about how he masturbates to the thought of her, and he wanted to marry her. No respect for Josh, by the way. He's like, I want her... 
to leave Josh. I want to be able to marry her. I love her. Okay. So they search a little further and find in his master closet piles of plastic baggies with Susan's name on them. They're all dated, like Susan Susan Powell, November 2001. Like, they're just all dated. And in these plastic baggies are her underwear. There's plastic baggies of her tampons. I know. Plastic baggies of cotton balls she had used, like, to remove nail polish. Um, plastic baggies of nail clippings, strands of hair. Um... He had pictures of her face superimposed on naked bodies, like, so he could pretend he had naked pictures of Susan. Um, he had pictures of her that were clearly taken without her knowledge all over town. Like, he was following her. He had pictures of her walking into work, um, walking with her friends, hundreds. Um, he was also a songwriter, <laughs> isn't everyone joe exotic no susan cox Powell, creepy ass father-in-law he wrote songs like that were literally called susan with the sunlight hair about secret love and shit he says he has very very deep feelings for susan and um this is um the most disturbing part and i'm just gonna play some of it for you because The way that I would say it is not going to do justice to how terrible and creepy and terrifying this scenario is. But they find boxes and boxes and boxes of home movies. Stephen Powell was, he recorded everything, like everything, for his life. Like he kept a video diary of his entire life. Like maybe people would care what he had to say about anything like You know, some people record Christmas and vacations. This dude recorded himself doing everything. So they find all these and they're like, hmm, I wonder. And um, what they find are hours and hours of disturbing footage of Susan. That there are some things that she doesn't, she doesn't know she's being recorded. There are instances where he's like recording conversations with her telling her, like, oh, I just want to see, like, a life in your day. I'm going to record you all day. And you can tell she's kind of uncomfortable. There are recordings of himself talking about how much he loves Susan. There's recordings of himself. Um, He would hook the video camera up to the TV and then record himself masturbating to the footage he had shot of Susan. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play some of the... uh, just a couple clips of the recordings and then I'll try and fill in maybe anything I missed because there's so much, so much that he recorded. She did that for me. Wow. That was good. Now we gotta show how happy I am. Mm. Got a worshiper. She just turns me on. I'm in a perpetual state of turn on when she's around. I had to get a picture of this dress. She was so beautiful. Back here, it was a jacuzzi. I'd love to spend the evening in here with Susan is what I'd like to do. So, I probably do some pretty, you know, some people might think they're weird. Here are the panties that I picked up out of Susan's laundry. God, they smell so nice. I think she's the most beautiful thing that ever walked the earth. I would like us to have, be able to do this actually on her body. I just had what is probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. Here's my stash of pictures that I feel very fortunate to have. There she is and I don't know when. This is another high school shot probably. That's what she must have been wearing couple of mornings ago when I was taping her, doing her makeup. Every time she takes a shower, I'm anxious to get into her laundry. But if she didn't notice that, she's, no, she did. She had to. And God, it was so nice. It was so nice. And I love that. Susan has been feeling ill. She had a cold. And... 
I offer to rub her feet, to rub her toes, to give her some stimulation. Josh was sitting across the room on the on the chair, and he wasn't always watching, so I sort of took liberties as he didn't watch. Okay, so <laughs> that's a lot. You can just hear the creepiness in his voice. If you look him up, if you look up these videos, um, he just looks creepy, like he would be saying these things. Um, it's just so disturbing to me, and I feel so bad. I feel bad for the things that Susan knew he was recording, like her doing her makeup and stuff. I feel even worse about the things that she didn't know he was recording. Um, there's a clip where he talks about how he worships her, and um, the video that goes along with that clip of his voice, he's zooming in on her butt through, like, a window. Like, they must have had an addition on their house, so, like, the laundry room kind of has, like, twist blinds. Like, maybe it was outside once. So, he's, like, zooming in through these blinds at her doing laundry on her butt, talking about how he worships her. Um, when he's recording her doing her makeup, she walks to leave and so she's in front of him, so she uses her hand, and she's holding, like, a square purse to cover her butt, and he asks her to move her hand, please. Can you just please move your hand? Like, he wants to... He wants to record her in these creepy ways so he can use it later. Um, he would follow her in his van and record her going from place to place to place, um... I think there was a recording in there where he talked about how he just needed to get a video of the dress. He followed her to work that day to get, like, a video of the dress she was wearing because he didn't want to forget it. He wanted to have it in his camera so he could look at it. Um, the video of him walking around the home, he flips the camera to show a jacuzzi tub. And he says that he would just love to spend an evening in there with Susan. That's all he wants to do. And he knows it's not going to happen, but that's all he wants. He says, um, I've seen her breasts before. She doesn't know I have seen them, but I have when she got out of the shower. Like, he is alarmingly cre- I know we joke about perverts a lot, but, like, this man is a straight-up pervert. He has hours and hours of secret footage of Susan. Oh, God. I can't even talk about it. It's so gross. Um, he would- he talks about her underwear out of the laundry. He would steal them. Like, he would just take her underwear out of the laundry when she was in the shower to keep them so that he could um, put them on his face and just smell her. Um, like I said, he had videos of himself masturbating to these pictures and videos he took of Susan that she didn't know. Um, he also, it's not going to come as a shock to anyone, he had an obsession with porn. Like, right, not porn of his, like, not just secret videos of his daughter-in-law, like, actual porn. Um, Josh's sisters in this documentary, Jennifer is the one, and she is completely on the side of Susan this whole time, which was kind of refreshing to see someone so close to, um, who they think did it and still not defend them. So Josh's sister said that, um, there came a time where Josh's dad, Stephen, approached Susan and seriously and legitimately asked if Josh and him could share her. Like, I know you're married to Josh, but you could also, we could also be married, and Josh and I could just share you. So this is the time that they moved to Utah. So this all happened right after they got married. Like, they're newlyweds, and her father-in-law is trying to marry her and is trying to sleep with her. Um... So, this is when Susan's friend was like, this is when Susan approached me and was like, I never told you the truth about why we moved. Um, they said they moved to be closer to Josh's mom and sister and to just kind of have better job opportunities, but they moved purely to get away from Stephen. Um, there came a point where he would try and sneak cameras under the door while she was in the bathroom, like trying to get video footage of her using the bathroom. Um, he would find any excuse to touch her. He would look at her weirdly. 
And, like, Josh just brushed all of this off. Like, Susan would come to him and be like, this is happening. I don't like it. It's very weird. You should care. And he just, like, did not. Um, the police said there were over 5,000 photos of Susan, but there were also videos of random women in public. Like, you would see him, there's a, a clip of him across the street videoing this girl talking to her friend, like, paying at lunch, like, getting ready to leave. And he is videoing her and waiting for her to get into her car with her skirt on. So he could see her, like, get into the car with her skirt on. Like, just, he, he was ultra creepy to Susan, but he was also just a creep in general. Which is just so disturbing. So, after the police find all of this, they're starting to think that Stephen may for real be connected to this disappearance. Because, because why the hell not? So, they don't find anything to connect him to the crime of Susan missing. But they do find a bunch of photos taken through the window of his neighbor's house of their two young daughters, naked in the bathtub, on the toilet, undressing in their rooms. Um, There's photo and video of, like, all the other neighbors in the neighborhood through their windows. So, um, Stephen actually gets arrested for child pornography and voyeurism for being creepy as shit, which opens the door for Susan's parents to get custody of the boys, because um josh still has them at this point and they've been trying to get the boys because josh is involved in a disappearance slash murder investigation so he doesn't need to be having them so they use this to like they're like all right you're creepy child pornography we're taking the boys so they hoped when they arrested steven for all this that it would make him fess up like maybe he would accept a deal for information Like, hey, if you just tell us what happened to Susan, we can cut this way down. But he just shut down. He offered no information on Susan. He didn't talk about the tapes at all. And he was sentenced to just 30 months in prison. And then they kind of um, shut down the investigation on him. Like, we really don't have anything on him. This was like a long shot and we did find some really creepy shit. And it may help us later, but in actuality didn't find anything connecting him to that day or anything. Okay. So they go back and try and get more information on Susan. So they go to her work to try and see what her life was like from a work environment. Like, maybe we're too close. Maybe Josh's family and all of that isn't going to give us the answers or insight that we need. Maybe we need to go outside of the family and see, like, what she was talking about, what she was doing. So they go to her work, and that's where they learn that Susan had a safety deposit box, which was odd because not one single person has brought this up so far. Not Josh, not Josh's family, not Susan's family. Nobody has brought up the fact that she has a safety deposit box. This is when they remember they found a single key in Susan's purse that first day they went inside and did like the loop around and they thought it was odd because it was a weird looking key. It didn't go to anything. There was just one of them. It wasn't attached to anything else. So they're like, okay, that's for the safety deposit box. So, um, and this is where I'm going to stop. But before I do, they gain access to the safe deposit box. They open it. And this is where they find a video done by Susan. This is, if you know about this case, you know exactly the clip I'm talking about. Um, I will put it at the beginning of Friday's episode because this is going to be a two-parter. But um, this is where they find a video. They pop it in the player. It's like a close-up of Susan's face, like a selfie, but with a video camera. And she's basically like, this is me. I'm documenting all of our assets in case something happens to me or my family. But, you know, hopefully we'll all be happy and okay and you'll never need this. And that is where I'm going to stop. So, um, this is insane. This, I wish I could say that the worst of this is over, but it's not. Um, so, 
I will release part two on Friday, probably alone still. Um, so stick around and wait for that. Um, I promise you it takes turns you don't even see coming. Things that you're not even thinking of are going to happen and you're going to be like, what the fuck is happening in this entire case? So trust me, you are going <laughs> to want to get part two early and I'm going to try my best to get it on the Patreon on Wednesday. Um, please forgive me if I don't. Um, I do, I have to work these next couple days. I have to do this alone. It's just a lot, but, um, I'll post an update for sure if I don't get it on the Patreon by Wednesday, but I'm going to try my damnedest. So, um, in the meantime, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at almost pod. Um, you can email us at almostpod at gmail.com if you have any questions, comments, concerns, corrections, um, compliments, anything, suggestions. We love it. Um, we did get a couple of interesting tidbits from last week's case. The, um, um, the Father Gerald Robinson, which um, I'll just wait for Taryn to get back to do those. But um, just know that we do read like all the DMs and stuff. So if you prefer to send anything that way, we do read and interact and um, I'll bring it all up. Um, if you're listening on iTunes, please give us a five-star review because this was really hard <laughs> and it'll make Taryn happy. So, um, yeah, I'm going to end this one right now. And when I tell you that it's going to get even more insane, please believe me, even if you don't think it can. <laughs> Bye! This is me, July 29th, 2008. It is 1233, mountain time. Um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. Hello, hello, hello. It's me, Madison, again. <laughs> um, I just decided, um, I just decided to record both of these parts back to back really quick before I go to work. That way I can have part two on the Patreon on time. And if you're not on the Patreon and you're listening on Friday, thank you so much for coming back after my first solo episode. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't scare you off because it is such an interesting story. And I, we are really sorry that <laughs> Taryn and nobody else can be here to comment on it. But um, I'm just going to keep going. So thanks so much for coming back. So we left off at the police finding Susan's safety deposit box and they found that video which is the clip that I just played at the beginning where she's just very somberly looking into the camera and explaining what she is doing so um this is when we learned that like Susan had had enough of Josh and his controlling ways and all that stuff and she had talked to her friend Kersey and Kersey encouraged her to see a divorce lawyer like, even just to see what her options are. So, um, Kersey watches the kids so that Susan can go see the lawyer. And that's where the lawyer tells her to document all their assets so Josh can't hide anything if they get a divorce. So that's why she was kind of... That was the purpose of that video. Um, it You could read a little deeper into it that she was kind of trying to set it up in case something happened as well. Not just the divorce, but... Her lawyer encouraged her to, like, all Josh's computers and all, like, his trinkets and stuff with all his technology bullcrap. But get all that on camera so that um, if he tries to hide anything or take anything from you, if we decide to divorce him, you have proof that those items exist. Which is very smart. 
So then Susan confronts Josh and tells him that she's thinking about getting a divorce if he doesn't get it together by their anniversary in April. So this is when Josh is like, if you divorce me, I will get the kids. I will take the kids away from you and you will never see them again. Because um, when Josh's parents got divorced, Josh's dad actually got most of the children. I believe Josh's mom only took Jennifer with her. So, um, so he knows that it's possible for the dad to take the kids. He probably assumes his dad can help him do whatever he did. And I mean, that's terrifying for Susan because all she wanted to do was like be a mom and a wife. And now her marriage is falling apart and he's threatening to take her kids away from her. Like the only other thing she cares about. So if you're kind of wondering, like, why didn't someone just leave? Because it's not that easy. Um, so, however, the tape wasn't the only thing hiding in Susan's safety deposit box. Um, they find a piece of paper folded four times and stapled shut. And the front of it says, Susan's last will and testament. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the back says, do not give this to Josh. I don't trust him. Josh Powell is not allowed to possess this. <laughs> Which is just insane. She's literally speaking beyond the grave at this point. Like, please listen to me. So inside, it says, literally in her handwriting, it says, if something happens to me, it isn't an accident, even if it looks like an accident. She's literally telling everyone, Josh did this to me. If something mysteriously happened to me, it's not a mystery. It's not a secret. I know who did it, and I'm telling you exactly what to do. Which is insane, but they still have no physical evidence connecting Josh to this disappearance, because it's still just a missing persons case, because they don't have Susan's body. So it's not like they can go off this circumstantial evidence that Josh was Susan's murderer, because they, don't, they can't prove that Susan had a murderer yet. You know what I'm saying? This is where Taryn would answer, but she's not here, so. <laughs> so, um, it's just so hard for them because they know, we know, they know, but they physically cannot connect any of these pieces together. They do mention that um, they could have probably just went ahead and maybe done all of this in court, just like with, like, they they bring up Casey Anthony specifically that Casey Anthony was found not guilty because they inserted that separate story about Casey Anthony's father, which cast all the doubt, all enough doubt to clear Casey. So they were like, we could have went to court, but they could have brought in all that Stephen Powell stuff and let Josh walk free because of that. Like, we have seen this exact scenario play out. We don't, it's just not worth trying it one time and then letting Josh go free on everything that they have. So um, this is when they're able to crack into Josh's hard drives in 2011, where he was searching Topaz Springs, which is 30 miles away from where Josh said he was the night Susan went missing. So this is where cadaver dogs led searchers to a shallow two and a half foot grave where something was definitely burned inside of it but there was not enough DNA to give any indication of what or even who or what was burned in this shallow grave. I mean, it straight up looked like a shallow grave, though. Like, they said when they found this, like, they thought 100% that they had finally solved this. They could finally prove where Susan's body was, where he was in relation to where he said he was. And then um, there just wasn't enough DNA to give them the information that they needed. And then Josh's sister, Lena, said that as time went on, because this is a couple years later, that Josh just looked more and more innocent because, you know, how would he have ever gotten away with it, you know? As the years pass and things happen, like, he just looks more innocent. Why can't they? It's because your family is a bunch of psychopaths. That's why, Alina. So then police get another tip about another member of Josh's family who may know more than they are leading on. So, um, 
This is when a Boulder, Colorado detective was working at a satellite imagery place when they got a call from a man from out of town who was requesting high quality imaging from a salvage yard where his car was towed a while ago so that he can determine if it had been destroyed at the yard it was supposed to be destroyed at. So this is basically like if you're looking at something on Google Maps and you just like want a clearer image of it, you call these satellite companies and they let you know if they have any satellite images of the place you're requesting. Like I don't think you can call and they'll go out and get you high quality images, but they can tell you if they have any and they can update you if they get any. So that's kind of what happened here. However, the man that called was Michael Powell, Josh's brother. So after they figure this out, they call the Washington police to let them know like, hey, um, the brother of that missing woman's husband called wanting high quality satellite images of a junkyard in Colorado. So the Washington police then just decide to focus on him because at this point they they have so much but not enough. So they they'll grasp onto anything at this point. So they learned that Michael basically sold his car for scrap right around the time Susan went missing. And it was a pretty good car still at the time. Like this, I think what they say is like they were, Michael was visiting Josh after Susan went missing. He drove home. It kind of broke down. His car broke down in Colorado. And instead of fixing it, he just decided to scrap it where it broke down and leave it. But they said that the car wasn't in that bad of shape and it was definitely, definitely fixable at like a reasonable rate. So it was just all weird. So he basically just abandons this car in Colorado and gets a taxi, a full-blown taxi ride back to Washington State, which is just insane. Never, ever would I take a taxi ride from Colorado to Washington if I own a car that can be fixed. So they send some detectives out to the area where this car should have been scrapped at this scrapyard and, um inspect the whole thing with cadaver dogs and the cadaver dogs went right to Michael's trunk like right to it so they were able to recover the vehicle then and take it back to Utah and inspect it there so they questioned Michael he said he was with his dad when Susan went missing and then he went to Utah to be with his brother um he didn't know what happened to Susan blah 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 then they dropped the bomb they're like oh by the way we have your car they never actually destroyed it at the salvage yard then he just like shuts down because you can see this interview too. Um, he is, he's not talkative, but he is like answering questions, being responsive, um, acting like a normal human. As soon as they tell him that they have his car, he d- doesn't talk anymore and he's very fidgety. Um, so not only did he not talk for the rest of the interview, he leaves, he ignores all the calls from the police and he never ever went back to, um, get questioned further like he straight up ignore them so then of course nothing conclusive came from the dna on the trunk um not that it just didn't match susan's there was nothing conclusive about it like it was very weird it's not like oh this is dna but it's not susan's it's like we can't tell at all what this is because it's i don't know if it had been overly cleaned or just dirty and old but um they couldn't get like anything out of it um remember when i said that things are going to happen that you don't (laughs) even have in the back of your mind um the whole rest of this story which is not gonna take as long as the last episode did but the whole rest of this story is alarming things take an alarming turn after this entire thing so like i said um steven got arrested for child pornography and voyeurism which allowed the opportunity for susan's parents to take the boys like they wanted because like everyone knows we all know josh is involved and they don't want josh to have the kids because he is a murderer but they had nothing to go off of josh is their dad in the eyes of the law he had done nothing wrong yet So they use that opportunity and the children are temporarily placed with Susan's parents because of the whole Steven thing. So they have the kids temporarily, like they have them full time, 
but at some point they're going to have to give them back to Josh after this is all sorted out. So they're trying to get the kids full time. Like they're like, no, we don't want them to ever go back to Josh. We would like to keep them because we think they're much safer here. And at the same time, Josh is obviously trying to get them back. He's like, yeah, no, I'm their dad. You can't prove I ever did anything and I'm their dad. So I'm going to get them back. So Susan's parents dig into Josh and his family as much as they can to try and get all the evidence against Josh so that they can keep the kids at this next hearing. They want to keep them permanently at this next hearing. Like they want, they don't want to keep doing checkups on Josh. So they get like all the incriminating things they can find in any file anywhere just to kind of overload the court with all this information on Josh. Like this has been going on for decades. I don't feel safe giving the kids to him. You shouldn't feel safe giving the kids to him. We should get to keep them. Like, they're on their shit. So, um, this is when they find, like, when they were kids, when Josh was a child, there was pornography everywhere in the house. Josh's dad encouraged them to hit their mother, to kick her. Josh took a butcher knife to her once. Um, He killed his sister's gerbil. He tried to kill himself. I mean... I, this case could be, like, so many episodes long, and I believe a podcast, is, it's called Cold. They really, really, really went into this case. They get really deep into it. Um, I have never listened to it. I don't really like to, I like to find my information and gather my own thoughts, so I don't really try and listen to too many things before I do an episode, but um, I've heard that it's insane how deep they go because there's just so much. This childhood could be in a completely separate episode, but it's not. So they, (laughs) they gather all this information, just trying to show that Josh had basically been troubled his entire life. Like this is not just a one-off thing. Steven had been peeping on the neighbors for two months and that's it. No, this has been happening Josh's whole life. It has affected Josh his whole life. And it's, the way things are going, it's not just going to, he's not going to just stop and become normal. So, um, Susan's parents gather all this information. They give copies to the social workers, to the courts, to like everyone, because at this point it really does look like Josh might get the kids back to them and to like everyone involved at this point, just because, um, he is the dad and courts do try and keep the children with their parents if they can. And like I said, at this point, Josh really hasn't done anything. They can't prove he has done anything. I mean, yeah, the Steven thing doesn't look great, all those creepy ass videos and stuff, but that's not about Josh. So it's going to be hard to separate them from him because of something his dad did, especially since his dad is now in jail. So it's really looking like they're going to go to court and Josh is going to take these kids with him after court. So that's why her parents are kind of going all in right now, because it's very important. It's like a very important hearing for this. So, um, Susan's parents also continued to have the children, like, see a psychologist who would come, like, once a week to their house and stuff and talk to the kids just because, you know, their life has been extremely traumatizing. So when Charlie was being questioned again or talking to the psychologist, he said, um, we can't talk about Susan or camping because I always keep things secrets, which is such an odd thing for a child to say for a child to, what is he's like seven, five or seven at this point, somewhere between there. And he's calling his mother, Susan and saying he can't talk about camping or Susan. It's just, um, It'll come up kind of later why I think this is kind of important, but it's just very odd. That whole thing is weird. Um, The kids also started, like, lashing out, obviously. They've had a pretty traumatic childhood. They they were would fight each other and take things from each other and argue, and it was just starting to, like, take their toll on them, I think. So Josh gives a statement at the custody hearing saying he never harmed the kids or put them in harm's way or in any type of situation or around people who would even be thought of as threats to them. Which is not true because his dad is a creep ass. And the lawyer for the state of Washington was like, 
yeah, no, like there's still an ongoing investigation that you are involved in. So you can't really be saying you wouldn't ever put them in these situations because they're in these situations constantly. So then they present a new argument that Josh also has a pornography pro <laughs> pornography problem because there was a shit ton of incestuous cartoon porn on his hard drives. Like, I don't know. I don't think it was all incestuous, but some of it was, and it was like all cartoon. It was just definitely not something you want brought up at a child custody hearing. Porn is bad enough, but if you're looking at like cartoon porn, incestuous porn, it's just, that's all bad. So basically pretty much because of that very point, Josh ends up losing the custody battle and the judge said that it's just not in the best interest for the children to go home today yet. She lays down some conditions that he can do and they can revisit if he does some type of psychosexual evaluation. And basically a psychosexual evaluation is like a polygraph test, but about like sexual situations, obviously like what turns you on? Have you ever looked at child porn? Have you had sex with someone under the age of 18 when you were an adult? Like, questions like that. Just to, just to make sure. Well, not to make sure, because none of this is ever polygraph of any sort is never sure. But um, it's like a starting point. Like, okay, maybe you just like some weird ass shit. He is, however, granted visitation rights with his sons as long as they are supervised. So... Susan's parents let the kids go on these supervised visits because, I mean, there's nothing they can do. They're just the grandparents, and they were hoping that Josh would never get the boys back. Like, they were hoping today would be the end of it, and they wouldn't have to do it or deal with him ever again. But that's not what the courts are going to do, and they're not going to take the kids away from their last living parent if they don't have to. So they were kind of like... Not that they understood, but they know they have to do this to cooperate to get things moving along. So after they read the verdict that Josh wasn't going to be taking the boys home with him that day, Susan's dad said the kind of calm that Josh was displaying was kind of alarming. Like he he could feel that maybe something was going to happen. Because, I mean, he wanted these kids back so bad and they're telling him he's not getting them and he's just suddenly okay. Like, it's it was just very odd and Chuck had picked up on that. And then even Susan's friends had all called the social workers and begged them to not let Josh get visitation with the boys. He didn't deserve it. Um, they just don't like the idea of it. They would hate to see something happen. Like, they, they begged. So, um, the kids... No. So they, like I said, um, Susan's parents cooperate. They uh, bundle the kids up and they let the first supervised visit happen on Super Bowl Sunday in February of 2012. So um, they get ready. A social worker comes to Susan's parents' house, picks the boys up, and then takes them to Josh's house that he has rented around the same area. So this is their first visitation. So the boys run ahead of her. Like, you know, they're excited to see their dad. So they get out of the car. She's getting her stuff. The kids are out. They're running up to the porch. And um, Josh lets them in the house. And then he looks the social worker in her eyes and slams the door and locks it. And doesn't let her in. I should say that the social worker is like 65 years old. She's just like a little old lady, so... This is kind of why Chuck kind of had a bad feeling. He kind of thought, like, okay, this old lady, what, I mean, Josh is clearly a psychopath. He could easily overpower this woman and steal the kids and just leave. Or he could hurt her. He could assault her. Um, just so many things. So, like I said, the boys run ahead of her. They're, like, one step ahead of her. And as soon as they get in the door, Josh slams the door so that the social worker can't come in, which is against the rules. He knows it has to be a supervised visit. She has to be in there with them. So she hears Josh tell Charlie that he has a big surprise for him, and then she can hear Brayden, like, screaming. So, okay. The social worker calls 911 immediately because, first of all, this isn't allowed, and second of all, she just has a very terrible feeling about 
the entire situation. So, um, I'm just going to play this 911 call. I have edited out certain bits that I feel are not relevant about, like, her name, age, things like that. There's a lot of pauses. But this is one of the most infuriating 911 calls I have ever heard. I remember hearing it for the first time, and, like, by the time the call was over, like, my mouth was dry because my mouth had been open for so long because I could not believe how this 911 operator was treating this woman. So I'm not even going to attempt to describe how this 911 operator acts. I'm just going to play it for you. It's like a four-minute clip. If you don't want to hear it or if 911 calls are triggering to you, um, just skip ahead four minutes and I'll kind of explain. I'll try and explain a little bit. Okay. Morning. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit. And something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay. That's pretty important for me to know. I'm um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. I'm just... This, Nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really um, shocked. And I could hear one of the kids crying, but he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is uh, one. Oh, just a minute. I have it here. You can't find me by GPS. No. Nope. But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS, and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. It's 8119 189th Street, Court East, 2 Allop, 98375. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline, and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... Smoke. He, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house is it? He's got kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. <laughs> Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay, so you don't live there, right? No, I don't... No, I'm okay. contracted to the state to provide supervised visitation. I see. Okay. And, and who is there to exercise their visitation? I am, uh, and the visit is who, with Josh Powell, and, who's and he is the husband that I supervise. So you supervise, and you're doing the visit? Yeah, you're I supervise yourself. I supervise myself. I'm the supervisor here. Wait a minute. If it's a supervised visit, you can't supervise yourself. If you're the I visitor, I do supervise myself. I'm the supervisor for the supervised visit. Okay. Well, aren't you the one make? Aren't you the one making the visit? Or is there another parent I'm the one, that you're supervising? No. There's, I'm the one that supervises. I pick up the kids as their grandparents. Yes. And then who visits with the children? Josh Powell. Okay, so you're supposed to be there to supervise Josh Powell's visit with the children. Yes, that's correct. And how did... And he's the husband of missing Susan Powell... How did he, how, this is a high-profile case. How did he How did he gain access to the children before you got he there? Grabbed, they, they, I was one step in back of them. Okay, so they he went into the, the house and then he head. locked you out. Yes, he, okay. he shut the door right in my face. Right, no. And the kids have been in there appro by now approximately um, 10 minutes. And he knows this children? is a supervised visit. Two, Brayden is uh, five and Charlie is seven. Is he alone then or is anybody I don't know. I couldn't get in the house. Uh, are you in a vehicle now or on foot? I'm in a vehicle. I'm in a Prius, on, um, a 2010 it? Prius. What color with is the it? doors locked. But he won't, he hasn't opened the door. Ma I rang the doorbell and everything. What, what color I begged him to let me in. Elizabeth, please listen to my questions. What color is the Toyota Prius? Gray, dark gray. All right, we'll have somebody look for you there. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. 
the first available deputy. Well, this, is, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he he didn't get his kids back. And this is really, I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay, so if that didn't make you extremely angry, I don't know. <laughs> I, I cannot believe... I wish I knew what happened to that 911 operator. I have no idea if they still have a job, if they had a job right after that. I have no idea. But if you decided to skip it because you don't like 911 calls, basically, um, he, I don't want to say he gaslit her, but he wasted a lot of valuable time asking her questions and kind of acting like she was dumb. And I just didn't care for it at all. So... After she says, you know, I fear for their lives, he's like, okay, I will have the first available available deputy contact you. Not even like, okay, we're going to send someone there. So after she hangs up is when Josh Powell's house blows up. And she has to call 911 a second time now. And I didn't get that 911 call. It's short. Um, it's very traumatic. Um, she's like... This man was in the house with his kids alone. He shouldn't have been. And he just blew up the house. So then the guy is like, well, was anyone in the house? And she's like, yes, two kids and a man. I've been, this 911, the first 911 call is like seven minutes long. She's like, I've been trying to tell you guys for over 15 minutes that these children are in danger. They are alone in a house with someone they should not be alone in a house with. So the house blows up. So the police show up obviously they go in once the fire is more manageable because the entire house is in flames you can find um news clips of this as well so once it's more manageable they go in and find out exactly what happened in there so the boys um brayden and charlie ended up passing away from smoke inhalation that is what they technically passed from um however the boys had hatchet marks in their skulls like deep wounds in their skulls so he hit the boys with the hatchet and knocked them out like to knock them out and then he dumped gasoline everywhere which is um why the social worker says she smells gasoline she wants to move her car he was dumping gasoline everywhere and then he sits on a drum of gasoline and then he lights the drum on fire so he exploded himself and then caught the whole house on fire to um, make sure that the boys would also pass um susan's dad said as soon as he saw the house he knew that the boys were gone he didn't hold out any type of hope or anything it, he wasn't hoping or wishing like he knew that it was on purpose and that josh had finished what he wanted to finish so um it has also said that the boys were laying on the floor holding hands which is just so terrible um the sheriff said it was something so evil he didn't even want to call it a tragedy he said it was a very brutal murder and there's just no need to sanitize or soften the situation at all like he just wants to call it what it is and there's no need to use any other soft term it was a brutal murder um susan's dad at this point in the documentary he's just he's so sad to watch because he you can tell how sad he is reliving the story and he just keeps saying things like like what more could i have done like i feel like i did everything i could i told everyone everything they needed to know i did what i should have but you can tell he just kind of feels, he, like, holds it in him. Like, not that it was his fault, but, like, why why couldn't something more have been done to prevent this easily preventable tragedy? Um, he also said that the boys' grave sites are always full of toys from kids in Charlie's class because Charlie was a little older. He had friends at that point. And he said it's just so, like, hard to explain how do you explain to a classroom of children what happened? So there's always, like, little toys in front of there. So then they figure out that Josh had been planning this murder-suicide for days. Like, this isn't just something he had 
like an idea of a crime of passion or anything like that. Like he had been actively planning this. Um, he had gone to the bank and emptied his accounts and closed them like completely preparing for this. That morning, he called his sister about utility bills and how to handle things if something ever happened to him. Um, he gave all the boys toys away. Um, 20 minutes before he caught the house on fire, he left an alarming voicemail for his family that was, um, you can also look this up if you want to hear it. But it was basically like, hello, this is Josh. I'm calling to say goodbye. I'm not able to live without my sons, and I'm not able to go on anymore. I'm sorry to everyone I've hurt. Goodbye. But then, this is why I kind of brought up that the kids were still being questioned by psychologists. Because then people were like, it may not have just been that simple. It may not have been that Josh was so devastated that he didn't get his kids back this one time because he had the opportunity to get them back at a later date. It's not like this was such a permanent thing. So people are like, who were the only two witnesses who could say for certain or shed some light on what had happened that night? The two boys. They were there. They were awake. Charlie, from a young age, had said that Susan had went with them camping. So as they get older, they're getting more talkative, um, maybe start to remember things better from being questioned so often and becoming more comfortable with their grandparents. They may just let details slip here and there. Um, it is possible that they were potentially going to incriminate him eventually, incriminate Josh. They were already talking about how mommy went on a trip and didn't come home. Um, Charlie had drawn, Charlie or Braden, I can't remember, had drawn a picture of Susan in the trunk of the car um, they would say things like mommy was in the trunk. So people are like, why wouldn't he get rid of the two people who know what happened at this point? He doesn't have the kids anymore. We know, we don't know, but we know he's capable of killing Susan. Why would he not be capable of killing his two sons who could eventually implicate him for this? And then he would really never see them again. So why wouldn't he just get rid of everything. So after this, the police really have nowhere else to go besides Josh's brother, Michael, who was there and tried to destroy a car. That's all they have. That's all they can go off of now that Josh and the boys are gone because they still want to solve this. Even if Josh is gone, they want some like justice for Susan and they would like to know where she is so she can be buried next to Charlie and Brayden. So they just all focus on Michael now. So they're convinced that Michael used his car to move Susan's remains to somewhere else more remote. So they think Josh um, Josh murdered Susan. There's um, some theories that he killed her on the couch. That's why the, there was blood over there and that he was trying to dry off the couch. So there's theories that he killed her there and then took the boys, air quotes, camping and dumped her body where they were camping, where he was like Google searching. So their theory is that Josh did that and then there was such an immediate response to Susan missing that he then had Michael move Susan's remains to somewhere even more remote than he had left them. So they're really hounding on Michael to try and get the location of Susan's body because they're convinced that he is the one who placed Susan at her final resting place. However, on February 11th, 2013, one year after Josh committed the murder-suicide, Michael Powell jumped off the roof of the seventh-story parking garage to his death. I know. God, I wish Taryn was here. I want to see your face. So this is the second person who has been involved that has killed themselves. Um, Alina, in this documentary, remember that's the sister who doesn't believe that anyone did anything wrong in her family, said that she was appalled that nobody investigated Michael's death and there was no evidence that it was a suicide and maybe someone pushed him and they don't understand why they weren't investigating Michael's murder, but there were, there were like witnesses that saw Michael jump off the roof. And it just kind of adds up. They were closing in on him. He knew it. Josh was gone. Like, he was going to go down for this fully if something happened. So, that was their 
last really lead because Susan's father never, I mean, not Susan's father, um, Josh's father never gave them any type of information where Susan's remains might be or what happened that night. So, I mean, you can only push and push so much. And then, um, Josh's father died in 2018 of a heart attack. So, I mean, that was their last living hope. Michael was their last living for real lead. They could have held out hope for Steven. And then when he died, it just kind of realized that we will never know what happened to Suzanne. Um, when Steve did have a heart attack, though, he was sent to the hospital. And he didn't die right away. So the police had planned to go to the hospital to question him again that morning, like try and get a deathbed confession or something. But um, he ended up passing away before they could even get there. So that's really the extent of this disappearance and crime and story. I, I, this is one of the most disturbing cases for me, I think, just because of the intricacies and all of the things that stemmed from this one thing. Like, Susan goes missing. Um, we find out that Josh's father had been creeping on her. Um, Josh kills the boys and himself. His brother kills himself. His dad dies. So they think that Josh had been planning to kill Susan for a while. And what they think happened... I don't, this is just like a theory out there. A couple of people, like some of her friends have mentioned this theory and I'm just kind of read of what I'm going to read a couple of things that people think may have happened and see if you agree with any of them. So what they think happened was Josh actually poisoned Susan Sunday night when he made that meal, because remember he never ever cooked. It was very odd. And, um, Giovanna said like he portioned everything out just right like it just looked weird and Susan had told Giovanna that she hadn't been feeling good the past week so it's possible he had been like which is common in poisonings like slow poisoning like poisoning her a little and a little and a little more and that she was immediately tired when she they finished dinner and then she was going to go up to lay down so he made her food she felt sick and then he picked up his mess after that. Others think that Josh may have attacked Susan because there were those 16 blood droplets near the clean couch and the blood was determined to be Susan's blood. So they think it could have been like from strangling, like it may, the blood may have came out during a strangling and that's why there was so many tiny minute droplets. Um, there is also a, going back to Josh's father, um, there is a recording where Steve is admitting his infatuation to Susan. Like, he is recording him telling her finally that he is in love with her. He's telling her he's falling in love with her. He can't stop thinking about her. Telling her that he was extremely aroused around her. And telling her that he thought that she was definitely also a little aroused around him. And um, in this recording, she's just trying to keep things civil because remember that's who she was, that her and Josh were so different. She didn't want to make anyone mad or have any type of further confrontation than what is already happening. So she's just trying to keep things civil. She's telling him, you know, like, I'm like a step below your children. Like, I'm married to your son. I'm your daughter. Like, let's just keep it a daughter-in-law, father-in-law relationship. I mean, that's working for me. We don't need to, you know, she was just being as nice as she possibly could in this situation. So, um, he writes in his journal that he still believes that Susan is in love with him and he can't wait until Susan is, is his wife one day. And this started a chain reaction that I mentioned earlier where, I don't know if I actually mentioned it, I might have taken it out, where they think that Steve was trying to break up Josh and Susan because he thinks it will finally cause Susan to be his wife. So... Like when, like Josh would spend hours on the phone with his dad and he was brushing off all these allegations. They think that maybe that whole time Stephen was kind of like putting a bug in Josh's ear that maybe Susan wasn't so great and maybe he should leave her or she was doing this, she was doing that. So, um, oxygen is actually the one that presents 
the idea that this is the real reason behind her disappearance, like this was the catalyst, but it backfired and caused Josh to murder Susan. On the day Susan went missing, Stephen wrote in his journal, I feel like Josh did a truly stupid thing and probably disposed of her body in a truly grotesque way. I think he probably went to some former industrial land west of West Valley and cremated her. Which is scary accurate of what they think happened. And ended it by saying, Josh's life with Susan was utterly miserable. Evidently this tragedy is my answer for why Josh hung on. He wanted to do it his way and avoid a messy and costly divorce. Which ties into them being married in the Church of Latter-day Saints where divorce is just... It's not only not common, it's so frowned upon that it just wasn't worth it to do it. So, um, Susan is still considered a missing person. The case is still open and they still are investigating all leads they get, which I think is so sad because I think we all know that Susan, something happened to Susan. Um... Susan's family isn't giving up. They know they aren't going to find her alive, but they are not giving up hope to find her body. So um, they're still trying to get into the rest of Josh's hard drives. They're trying to do anything they can to recover Susan's remains so that she can be buried next to Charlie and Brayden, which I think is just so sad that that is what they're hoping for because this all was so preventable. Um... Which, it being so preventable, ties into the fact that um, Susan's parents actually sued the state of Washington for, um, like, wrongful death for what happened to the boys because that obviously should have never happened. Josh should have never had access to any type of visitation with those boys, and they should have known, like, setting up a visitation like that at his own home was just a recipe for disaster. So Susan's parents sued the state of Washington and a jury did find the state negligent in allowing this thing to happen. So they were awarded um, $16 million for each child. I think that this just happened this year because they were originally awarded like $98 million and then it got lowered this year. And I think they're appealing the fact that it got lowered because, I mean, the state of Washington did fuck up and they should pay for it. Um, Her friends and family hate that she's now always going to be remembered as the woman who went missing, and she's not going to immediately be remembered for what a great friend and mother she was and how great she was. I mean, they just hate that, like, what should have happened in her life. She should have had this great life, and then when someone mentioned Susan, be like, oh, she was such a good mom, but instead, if you mention Susan Cox Powell, it's like all of the terrible things that happened after her I want to say death, but when she went missing. So that is the end of this extremely chaotic and messed up case. Um, I hope you stuck around. I hope I wasn't too boring for you. I know I'm not the funnest, but I try. Um, We will be back to normal next week, I'm sure. The one shot might still just be me alone, but I might try and do something fun for that. We'll see. Which only matters if you're listening on the Patreon, because if you're listening on Friday, the one shot will already be out. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for sticking with us this crazy week. Um, hopefully things will go back to normal pretty soon here. We're just, we're just trying to do the safest things we can, flatten the curve, things like that. So, thank you so much. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Almost Pod. Um, search Almost a True Crime Podcast anywhere and we should show up. You can email us at almostpod at gmail.com. Any type of comments, corrections, concerns, suggestions, compliments. Um, if you're listening on iTunes, please give us a five star review or leave a worded review. It helps so much. It helps more than you know to have people find us and. Um, It just really helps. And I believe that's it. Oh, I didn't mention the Patreon at all, but um, if you want to join the Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash almostpod where we release um, part two of all part two episodes early. Um, We record video recordings of us recording. We have um, bonus episodes coming up, just like a bunch of fun stuff. And it's just an easier way for us to interact with you, really. 
So yeah, thanks so much for sticking to my giant solo two-part episode. (laughs) Um, I hope you don't hate me and aren't sick of my voice. And Taryn will be back next week. Bye!